You're listening to Word of Mouth from BBC Radio 4. When I was a boy, we used to go over the park, and in the corner of the park there was some waste ground, and we used to call it the Dingles. We used to say, we're going over the Dingles. And when I think about this place, um, there were kind of humps and hollows, and we used to run up and down them, or we used to take our bikes uh, through them and over them and under them, and, and, we, and so we loved it. We loved it. We just used to call them, we're going over the Dingles. There was something magic about it. Now, Dominic Tyler has been collecting these kinds of words for his book Uncommon Ground, A Word Lover's Guide to the British Landscape. And Dr Laura Wright, reader in English language at the University of Cambridge, joins us as our expert linguist. Dingles. Let's have my dingles, Laura. What are they? Well, the word dingle first occurs in the 13th century. It's found in Yorkshire. Oh, but I was in Pinner, not Yorkshire. Yes, but the word starts off, it seems, in Yorkshire dialect, mm-hmm. but it means a steep ravine, a <laughs> steep cleft cloven between two hills. But then it doesn't occur in any manuscripts until the 1600s, when Milton used it in the lines, I know each lane and every alley green, dingle or bushy dell of this wild wood. That explains is, my interest in literature. I was over the dingles doing Milton. In particular, Milton. Well... Not knowing the dialect word dingle, readers thought that dingle and dell were synonyms. So dingle and dell was interpreted as meaning dell and dell rather than ravine and dell. And so that's what dingles have come to mean. Lots of small depressions in the ground. So, Dominic, how did you come to write this book about uh, the British landscape and these special words that are attached to it? Did you have a moment like mine, that we, you know, a single riding attachment over, to a word? Over the dingles. Well, I grew up in rural Cornwall, so I, I thought of myself as a country boy for many years and then moved to London to study and then to work. And uh, I thought I still had this deep connection with the countryside, as a lot of people who do that move still feel. Uh, and then in 2007, I was asked to work on a book about wild swimming and had the opportunity to travel a lot around strange uh, rural areas. And at one point I needed to write about uh, a a journey I'd made across Welsh hills. And I found that to my intense shame and surprise, all this connection I thought I had with the countryside wasn't represented in my vocabulary at all. I had no words to describe this simple journey. So that that was the kind of uh, the moment that I realised I personally had lost a lot of language. I'd lost a, a kind of lexis for the landscape. So you're looking at a, a, a landscape, you're on a mountain or in a, in a valley somewhere and you're looking at something and did you th- suddenly think, I haven't got the word for this? Yeah. That, could, what what was could, it? What I was could, the thing? I could picture the journey and, and it was across uh, some really sort of tussocky mounds of uh, grass. grass. Yes. And I, I came, when I came to write it, I thought, well, tussock, well, that sort of seems like the right word, but is it actually the right word? Should they maybe be hillocks? Should they be hillets is this is this a you know branch of the mountain or is this a is this a, a mini mini something a, yeah, a mini hill. Sort I'm, of again grass? i'm lost i'm lost for words just thinking yes. about it yeah. a sedge a sedge tump yeah a so bent. I, I wanted to be able to be really specific about these features and i just i just didn't have the words so that started me looking for words to use and resources especially where i could find the words that i would need to do similar sorts of jobs in the future so what were your resources? How did you go about collecting them? What I found was there isn't a single resource for these words, which was kind of surprising and inconvenient. Uh, so when I started collecting them, I'd collect them through, through word of mouth. I'd collect them from old maps. I'd collect them from old dictionaries. What are particularly good is turn of the 19th century um, dictionaries of dialect. A lot of people around that time seemed to be involved in collecting dialect and colloquial words. Well, very explicitly, they were collecting for the English Dialect Society, which was running in the 1880s and the 1890s, and in particular, vicars, mm. because vicars had access to agricultural labourers. They were their parishioners. These are the days when vicars give you tea. Yeah. So if you come knocking on the door, you know, on a Sunday afternoon or something for your, for your cup of tea, the vicar would say, oh, old Harry, what do you call this? And then he'd hold up a piece of sheep's wool caught on a yeah. barbed wire fence or whatever it may be. And they would then collect these and write them in and send them into the English Dialect Dictionary, which was published around the 1920s. And it, it really is literally a repository of county words yeah. elicited and by vicars. that's what you were trawling. Yes, yes. And I noticed there were a lot of vicars. I wondered why that was. <laughs> There's the great uh, Reverend Parish who did... Uh, Sussex. So let's let's engage with some of these. Now mm. you're very keen on mud, I think. Yes. So yes. Lots of, lots of wonderful words for mud, which I seem to remember Americans don't call it mud, do they? They always call it dirt, don't they? I was always quite surprised by that. But what mm. what did you find on mud? Well, 
Parrish in Sussex said that he'd found at least 30 different terms for mud. Gubba. Gubba. Stug. Pug. Slob. Sleech. And slab. And they, they tend to have different meanings determining different constituents of the mud. So there might, might be mud that's particularly sticky or mud that is very washy or mud that kind of gets accumulated on your boots as you walk across the field so that you feel like you, you know, you're know you carrying a hundred weight by the time you get to the other end of the field. And you can't go over it and you can't go under it. You actually as we want, go as through we it, I think. Yeah. Yes. Actually, that word pug you mentioned, I've heard potters talk about pug. That's when they scrape up all the little dry bits after they're making a pot and they haven't baked it. Uh, and then they stick it in the, with water, and then they can reuse oh. it or reuse it as slip. So it's reconstituted. Okay. So pug is alive and well in uh, on the potter's wheel, if you like. Yeah, and you've got, got some other lovely ones there. Lob lolly. Oh, lob lolly's grand, isn't it? Lob lolly is originally a word for um, ship's stew, so it would be what you get served up in the mess of a ship, and it's a kind of thick, sludgy gruel. But it's particularly used in in the states. It's used in the UK as well, but it's particularly used in the states for a kind of mud hole that's got a crust. A deceptively dry crust. Oh, those fun top. things to put your foot yeah. on and then sink through. Exactly, yeah. So there's there's danger in a lob lolly. And I recognised Clart on your in, in your book there because I seem to remember I heard a farmer talk about you know like when sheep do a poo and little bits stick to their yeah to their fleece. I think they call in some parts of the country they call those Clarts. Oh, do they? Okay, I think so. I yeah. know Clart as that particularly sticky mud that does just stick to everything. And, yeah. and kind of weighs you down. Is Laura... cow belly one of your mud words? Well, maybe it would sneak in, but cow belly is much more sensuous than most mud words. Cow belly is a word for this incredibly fine sediment that, that falls in the slowest part of the river, so usually in the meanders ah. of a river. So and, kind of silt. Yeah, a kind of silt. But it's, it's particular in that the experience of putting your foot into a cow belly is very specific. It's that moment where you can't quite tell if you're reaching a solid or a liquid, and you can normally only tell that your foot is descending into the cow belly because there's a slight change in temperature, it's slightly colder. And it squeezes through between through your, your toes. toes. Yes. Yes. Which some people absolutely hate, but I quite like. <laughs> no, I quite like that. I like it. I like that. I did a lot of that in the Thames Estuary as a child. Ah, yes, well, we know about you and your mudlarking. <laughs> yeah. Now, have you found that many more people than you might have expected have terms tucked away in their family? So it's like a kind of family repertoire yeah. of very specific... Words for bits of landscape, local landscape? Yeah. I, when I was in the Lake District, I um, talked to a farmer who suddenly came out with Ginny Green Teeth. Now, Ginny Green Teeth is, is a lovely landscape term. It's, she's a mythological character. She appears in all sorts of parts of the United Kingdom, and she's, she's one of those cautionary tale characters. She lives in streams and rivers, and she's there to drag children in. So, obviously, it's used as a cautionary tale to keep kids away from dangerous, watery places. But Ginny Greenteeth has given her name to these kinds of watery places as well. So when you find one of those uh, ponds that's completely covered in duckweeds so that yes. you can't see the water, or, oh, yes. or a stream... Very that's dangerous, because they yes. think they can yeah. walk on yes. yes, yes. Or a stream that's bedraggled with kind of lichens and mosses and algae, so it's all green. Well, that is, that has become a Ginny Greenteeth. So I was talking to this guy in the Lake District, and he suddenly remembered that when he was a kid, just above his grandfather's farm, there was a Ginny Greenteeth. They used to call it the Ginny Greenteeth. And it's this beautifully algae-festooned um, stream that's covered in green. Yes. And there's some very interesting words for things you don't really recognise until you hear them described. Mm. Um, tell us what a desire path is and how that came about. So I would love to know where a desire oh, path came you don't, from. You don't know? No. I, don't, I know roughly where it came from. I mean, from. I lived in a road called Love Lane, and that was sort of self-explanatory, <laughs> really. <laughs> Maybe it was that. Yeah. It seems to have come from uh, 1950s US geographical topological surveys. The first time I can find it being used in something in print is from uh, a survey from Chicago, from transportation surveys, and it was called the Desire Line. And then later it was used by another survey in Central Park to talk about the unofficial pathways across bits of lawn bits of grass mm. and that's the meaning that's really kind of taken off now uh, so a desire path is the unofficial route that people take through parks and uh, gardens and lawns and and so with their footfall they craft a new unofficial path that then becomes an established path that people use i know <coughs> the phenomenon of course we all know the phenomenon mm. but the term i know for it is invisible hand and that actually comes from the economist Adam Smith, who was talking about unintended benefits from the actions of others. Yeah. So if lots of people all 
want to get from A to B and there's a lawn in the middle, they're all going to make exactly the same decision yeah. at the same point as to where they're going to cut across that lawn. And, of course, the unintended benefit is you end up with a path. But nobody feet. actually... Yes, exactly. <laughs> nobody actually put it there, but it's... it's um, so it's, is the desire in this the fact that you desire to go there? So we talk about a shortcut meaning you're somehow other cutting the journey short, yeah? Yeah. But desire is because you want to go there. Is that, am, I, yeah. am I being obvious here? The path becomes the thing that, that shows the desire of all the feet that have, that have trodden it. Oh, and what's yes. amazing about it is that people en masse tend to make excellent decisions about how to lay out paths in parks. If you, if you had no official paths in a park and just let people create their own desire paths, you would end up with the most efficient use of journeys. You could get a computer to do it and they wouldn't do it as well. People's desire expressed in this way is actually more efficient than the computer. And sheep do. They walk the contours, don't they? Yeah. On the side of a, a moor. Oh, in it's fact, wonderful to see there. contour lines on yeah. the... Yes. There's probably a word for that, isn't there? Sheep path. Sheep path, yeah, It's not yeah. very good, is it? Yeah, we could do right. better than that. I'm we sure could. we could. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about tide rat, which is one of your words. I picked that one up because it's, um, it's a Dutch word mm. and it seems to vary slightly from century to century. So in the 14th century, it means a shipwreck. Uh -huh. But then humans being what they are, we want to get things out of shipwrecks. So in the 15th century, it comes to mean the nice stuff that rolls in on the tide from the shipwreck. Um, then the following century, it means any old crud that you can find there. It's then it gets to be, again, isn't it? It is, it is indeed. <laughs> then it goes to any old rubbish in any old pond. Right. And then after that, by the, by the time we get down to the 19th century, it can mean, in a field, nothing to do with water whatsoever. It can wow. mean if you've been pulling up, say, I don't know, potatoes or something, and you've been getting the potatoes, and then you strew all the stuff you don't want, all the vegetable remains that you don't need, that can be the rack as well. And that's rack with the W. And that, yeah, yeah. Did you um, come across people using tide rack Yes, I did. I mean, it's used a lot uh, now to mean the man-made stuff that comes up on the tides. Oh, yes. You know, the flotsam and jetsam and the, the, the plastic bits and pieces. Um, but what fascinated me about it was the, was the sort of potential extra meaning of rack, which also means retributive uh, punishment. So it can mean sort of um, revenge. And so this idea, or oh, you're, you're making a face, does it not? Well, no, I'm just I, yeah, I'm totally agreeing with you. The revenge of, of yeah. planet Earth on us for exactly. what we're doing and desecrating it with all these plastic containers. I mean, it's quite poetic, isn't it? You chuck it out and then the tide has its revenge on you by belching it back up onto your beautiful beach. That for me was a sort of wonderful, unexpected double meaning. I think Jeremiah Hopkins uses it um, in that poem where it begins, I woke to feel the fell of dark, not day. I think he's on some kind of rack mm. in his mind. So he's being, um, but he makes a pun on the rack without the W and the it's quite a dark it. rack and ruin. It's quite sort of, you know, it has yeah. that kind of thunderous justice sense. And there's it. a seaweed, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, a bladder, bladder rack. rack. Yeah. yeah, so that's the bladders that are washed up. I mean, it's a, mm. it has little bubbles in it, doesn't it, bladder rack? Mm. It's the air that keeps washed it alive. Washed up bladders. I'd never thought of them as I <laughs> You have some more wonderful terms for things that are washed up. Mermaid's tears and nurdles. Yeah. So mermaid's tears, I, originally it was quite a sort of twee Victorian word for beach glass that gets worn smooth. Oh, I collect those. Do you? Yes. Yes. No, I, well, so the washed go. up glass. It's, mermaid's it's, tears, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Well, at least oh, I've got I found, a word for them. I found references for that. But then later on, it's used for um, the plastic bits and pieces that get washed up which is obviously sadder and more depressing. So, yeah, uh, mermaid's tears it, and nurdles are, again, they're small particles of plastic that get, they get washed up. They're an absolute menace in the marine environment because um, fish eat them, mistaking them for fish eggs, and it can kill them. Uh, if they're small enough, it can have biochemical effects on, their, on them or it can just choke them, and that, it, it's a huge menace. And there's some amazing statistic about the percentage of beaches now that have plastic nurdles on them, I think. They've been nurdled. They've been nurdled. Yeah. You can certainly download um, leaflets from all the coastal authorities telling you to go out and look for these nurdles and mm. pick them up and try to get everybody to clean the beaches because mm. they're just so invidious. I would Some love to see a leaflet that used the word nurdle. I don't believe they do, do they? I bet they, they do. No. no. Uh, do they? Some of them oh. are so small that you'd never be able to pick them up. They're sort of microscopic. And at that stage, it's when they become really dangerous. To, to micro nurdles. Them. Micro nurdles, yeah. And what's that, what's that uh, wonderful uh, phrase that you came across for the tattered scraps of polythene um, plastic bags that you see um, that have got snagged high up in trees? What, what's that called? So these are witches' knickers? No. Yes. Which is lovely, isn't it? It's almost too good a word for, for such a. It's a bit um, explicit, though, isn't it? I don't know. Yes. Is it? Maybe you're thinking beyond 
a lot of them. <laughs> it's hundreds of witches hanging about, taking their knickers off. I'm sorry. This no, is, see, yeah. I think it's accidental. In my mind, what happens is the witch makes a low pass over the tree and then, you know, knickers get snagged. Ah. Yeah, poor I witch. don't think it's... It's not, ah. a, it's not a deliberate act. It's accidental. I wrote a poem about plastic bags. This is a, 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 the chorus goes something like, The bags are ripe on the plastic bag tree, Bags as far as the eye can see. Little joke coming up. Bags as far as... I can see. And it's because I had the idea that the, there were special plastic bag trees that produced the plastic bags, but no, it was witches. I'm sorry. <laughs> I intervened witches. in that. Yeah, That's lovely. But there is a kind of similarity in some of these terms, isn't there? You've got tide rack, witches' knickers, desire path. Are they all modern, these? Well, witches' knickers is modern. Witches' knickers comes from uh, the turn of the millennium. It comes from Ireland, I think. Right. Um, and well, tide rack is evidently a really old term, but oh, it's right, been yeah. but it's been repurposed because uh, of all the plastic. There you yeah. go. And then um, what was the other one we made? Well, desire path. You said that's fairly recent. It's twentieth yeah, century. It's a desire it? path. Yeah. It, again, it's been repurposed because it started off as a quite a dry sort of term for geographers to use or city planners to use, and it's now become quite an evocative term. And so and we could be quite one. nostalgic about all this, but at the same time, we're producing new ones. Yeah. Human beings. When I say we, yeah, yes. producing really good ones as well. I think. Mm. Some listeners might ask, Dominic, why are you doing this? Do you have a purpose behind it? <laughs> <laughs> well, my initial purpose was just to be able to describe the journey, just to have a bit more landscape language vocabulary. But but I think that if there is a bigger purpose, it's, it's that I think it's quite important to pay attention to the countryside and to nature, and that without a language to do that, you, you begin to use really vague general terms that don't allow attention to be paid. Robert McFarlane has just written very interestingly about this. He calls the um, he calls it a, a word hoard, and for him, the idea is that it, it represents a counter desecration phrase book. All these words, and they protect against us not paying attention to the landscape and not being able to describe it and have important, complicated conversations about the landscape. That's an interesting social point. The idea that the words could possibly have a sort of eco warrior function like that, just as words. But I wondered whether it's changed your own personal view. In other words, when you now step out onto the mountain and you know the word for, uh, I don't know, you've seen Devil's Punch Bowl. I know it's a place name, but let's say you're looking at another place that isn't called the Devil's Punch Bowl and suddenly you've got another word for it. Does that actually change the way you think about it because you've now got Nerdle and Cowbelly and so on? Is it, does it change you? Yeah, I think you do. It makes you attend to the, the minutiae more and to the details we have the big terms for the big things in the landscapes but there are also really lovely specific terms for the small things in the landscape the detailed words for the landscape are actually still with us and we do use them all the time but they're in our place names mm. and we've forgotten by and large what the original technical meaning was i'm thinking of all our halchs and huffs. say that again mm. Halch. Halch. which is a word for a nook an a old nook. english word for a nook and our, our huffs usually spell H-O-U-G-H, which yeah. you can think of in, in place names, or our hursts, our tofts, our thwaites, which meant quite specific things to the original people who did the original naming. Um, so to give you an example, the Old English word for the kind of hill that looks like a person's heel when you're lying down on your face. So if you imagine you're lying prone right. and you've got your legs stretched out behind you yeah. and your toes are sort of pointing directly south, as it were, that kind of slope that goes from your mm. heel down through your instep. Ivinghoe Beacon on the oh, I know Chilterns. Yes. You know, where you've kind of got the escarpment and then it sort of has the heel and then it goes down. Well, the, the hoe bit in Ivinghoe is the hoch, that is your heel. That's the mm. old English word for the heel. So if you're sensitive, I mean, if you know about the old elements, then they're still there. I mean, staying with the Chilterns, an aura was an old English word for a long hill whose profile was like an upturned punt. So if you can imagine a punt with its, you know, its swim barge ends yeah. and then turn it over. So again, you've got a very specific kind of level top and then a, what, a less than 45 degree or gradient what, going down. What place name? Chinna. Oh, Chinna, the it's cement the, place. It's the ore bit in Chinna, mm. in the Chilterns again. So they are, they are there. Mm. We used to know all of these, but you really need to study place names in order to to be able to retrieve them. Yeah. yeah, and maps become completely different documents once you've got some of these words in your head because mm. they're not just names, they're descriptive of the landscape. Yeah. Yes, this is stirring up some memories. Uh, we used to camp near Simmons Yat, 
Now, yat, uh, looking at Laura, must be an old word for gate or is, entrance. Yeah. Yes, yeah. which is on the River Wye, isn't it? That's right. I mean, we did a lot of geography tramping over the Chilterns that you're talking about, and the, the posh term is escarpment, but I think we always called it a scarp. So you shortened it. Yeah, it was An just Anglo-Norman called the scarp. Flipped. In fact, Chinna is at the bottom of, of the, the scarp. scarp. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, on the side of a hill, do you use these words, uh, Dominic? On the side of a hill where uh, the glacier started and it mm. bit back into the hill, mm-hmm. there are words for those, aren't there? I seem to remember on the, in Wales they tended to call it coom, coom spelling yeah. it C-W-M. Yeah. And, then, and then Corrie in Scotland. And I, I can I can remember just sort of when just when you do use an ordnance survey map and you you tramp about you do come across other words and then you can relate them to things that reading well you know when I was doing O level and A level English and so on so spinny and cops I remember from reading Thomas Hardy that's I think that's you know he seemed to be quite keen on those and then I seem to remember a tutor at university having some sort of scholarly jibe about um, a bosky wood because he said that. And you, you've got the word bosky, I think, haven't you, Dominic? I mentioned it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that he he was uh, he had some sort of scholarly job about it because he said a bosky wood meant a woody wood. I think that's a bit unfair. Actually. Was it? Yeah, I think I think a bos- bosky is for me more of a sort of thicket, and bosky is also a great word for being slightly drunk. Oh, really? Yeah, tipsy, oh, feeling a bit bosky. Yeah. So yeah. he might have been talking about a drunken wood, Milton. And what happens when we extend this into phrases and sayings? So you're, you're, you're quite wordy in, in your book, but in actual fact, when people talk about landscapes, they often sort of put pieces together. Uh, I can remember once talking to an Irish guy. I was working on a building site, and I was saying that I travelled on the night ferry, and he said, you've got to imagine a Galway accent here, he said, yes, it's sea and sky all the way over. Now, it's kind of, it's, it's very, uh, if you like, prosaic language, but by sticking it together it becomes the kind of poetry that you're looking at. And you've mm. got the word, I think, moonglade. Moonglade. I mean, it's a so. compound, isn't it? So yeah. uh, what's, what does that mean? What's a moonglade? Well, th- there's an alternative as well, which is moonwake, which is equally nice. Because a moonglade and a moonwake are both the, the path that the moon um, reflects in the water at, at night. So it's that oh, it seems yes. to be a silver trail leading, uh, leading across the sea to the moon on the horizon. But a glade normally is is on the land, isn't it? You have a glade in the middle of a wood, don't you? Yes, yeah, I think that glade in this sense is derived from uh, glad and glimmer and glisten. And and so it's more to do with a sort of reflective surface than, than a, like a glade in a wood. I have uh, to say, when you see the moon path, doesn't it look like you could walk on it? Mm. No, I'm also thinking that any poets listening are kind of busy making notes here, thinking they could assemble poems out of it. I'm not saying I am, but, you know, moon glade. I mean, it's a wonderful compound, isn't it? Um, do you know, I, I have another memory of reading, which is that you would hit these words, a writer would use the word, and then you'd have no idea what it meant because there was no little glossary. And I think mm. it was kidnapped as a kid reading it. And people kept hiding in a bluff. I think it was either that or 39 Steps, one or the other. And I, I never knew what a bluff was. All I knew was that people could be bluff, but I didn't know what a bluff was. I mean, that presumably has sometimes aroused your interest that you've, you, you know, when you're reading and you come across old words. That... Yeah, funnily enough, I had exactly the same experience with, with bluff. And I did, uh, I, I did a talk a while ago about this, this project with a group of people and did a little game called Call My Bluff. <laughs> and gave gave them bluff as a word and get, offered them lots of different definitions. And out of a crowd of about 200 people, I think maybe only a handful picked the actual definition of bluff. Laura, bluff, what actually is a bluff? Well, it's a nautical word for a ship or a shoreline that presents a flat perpendicular face. So, I mean, imagine it standing up completely at a right angle, at 90 degrees, as it were, as but opposed to a rake one. In Kidnap, they're running over the moors. So it must have been an inland cliff. Are you sure? Aren't you thinking 39 steps? That's why they <laughs> run over the moors. <laughs> Oh, no, so I, kidnapped as well. I mean, in America, a bluff is the same thing. You know, it's, a, it's this flat-faced, absolutely abrupt kind of cliff, but it can be inland. We tend to think of being an island. We tend to think of them as being on the shoreline, but they can be inland as oh, well. Oh, they can be inland. And it's the opposite to something that's raked. I mean, if you think of a, a ship, because it it's a nautical term, it comes from ships, which either have a, a bluff stern and bow where it's kind of just, you know, like a tub in the water, or it can be raked yeah. and shot. So beachy head, is that a bluff? Yeah, it is, isn't it? It is by yeah. now. I That's think lots it, of could erosion. Be, it, could be used, it could be used for a river embankment as well. Yeah. So yes. it would be the same abruptly. profile. Yeah. yeah. It would be the same if someone was being bluff. You know, obviously they're being but, abrupt. So it's oh, the exactly. presenting yeah. their cliff like features at yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> or something. <laughs> like Very beach, good. Yeah. Dominic, there's been a story in the news quite recently about uh, a selection of words relating to nature being culled from the Oxford Junior Dictionary. 
And there's even been a campaign to get some of these words reinstated, words like buttercup and pasture and blackberry. What's your view on this? It's a terrible shame that these words are falling out of use. I don't think that we should be attacking the Oxford Junior Dictionary for for doing what they're doing, which is actually measuring the corpus of words that, that kids are using. I think we should be taking that measurement as a sign that we need to get more nature into kids' lives. It doesn't seem to make sense to me to put those words back in uh, the dictionary if they're not being used. I think we should get kids to use them. I can remember being fascinated. We we used to camp... uh, I'm still on the the Welsh borders now. Um, We used to camp near a mountain that was called the Sugar Loaf. Now, I don't think any of us knew what a sugar loaf was. In fact, I'm not even sure I do. It's presumably how the sugar used to come. As a... You've been to Spanish markets, those wonderful indoor-covered places with, you know, medieval, a medieval emporium almost. Um, a sugar loaf is a conical object. It's about a foot high or yes. so. It's, it's not white and refined. It's usually filthy, dirty, brown-looking. And it's the best thing I can say is it looks like a World War II bomb, something you might lob. I mean, it's extremely hard and, and basically conical, so it's very apt for mountains. Oh, right. I'm not sure the mountain quite looks like that. But anyway, it's called the sugar loaf in English. I think there's a Welsh name for it as well. And it was a big deal. You know, would we be able to climb the sugar loaf? Um, so, you know, I got a sense of the kind of dimensions of it in the name. And me and my friend Mart, we climbed it. And we were so, so proud of it. And when we got to the top, my friend Mart said, you know, we, the border between Wales and England, I think it's the old border in the 50s, this is, said that there's a border between Wales and England. And we've really got to mark this. We've got to really commemorate it. And he said that we had to walk into England with our trousers down. So there's no connection now between sugar loaves and walking into England with our trousers down. And we did. That's what we did. We walked, But some people were coming up the path ahead of us, so we quickly had to pull up our trousers and stand there looking a bit sheepish. And then somewhere halfway down, Martin said, because he had the Ordnance Survey map, he said, we've crossed into England. So we pulled our trousers up properly and got back and walked all the way back to the camp. And when we got back, I remember our parents saying, well, what did you do? Did you climb the sugar loaf? And we said, yeah, we did. And I remember my dad saying, wow. That's amazing, guys. You've, you've walked about 15 miles, and I was so proud. I was so proud of this. I said, yeah, and we walked into England with our trousers down. <laughs> and my dad said, what? <laughs> what? Are you crazy? Or in Yiddish, are you Meshuggana? <laughs> and I remember thinking, no, we're not crazy. You know, we've commemorated this wonderful thing called the sugar loaf. Oh, well, there you go. Um, <laughs> well, look, thank you ever so much, Dominic Tyler. And, of course, Laura Wright. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks for listening. You can find other programmes about language and society at bbc.co.uk slash Radio 4.